نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون أما بعد We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the one who deserves to be praised abundantly and we ask Allah to exalt the mansion and grant his peace and salutations and blessings upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and upon his companions and wives and all those who follow them on their path of righteousness until the day of judgment. All you who have believed, be mindful of Allah and fear him the way he deserves to be feared and do not die except in the state of submission as Muslims. I could vividly and sincerely and honestly say that the English speaking community is oppressed. And I'm saying the English speaking community because we are using English as a means of communication between us. What I really mean to say is anyone who does not know Arabic in the ultimate sense is oppressed. And the reason I say this is because you are at the mercy of the speaker. You are at the mercy of the speaker. You are at the mercy of the translator. You are at the mercy of the selection of books that have been made available to you. If you don't have access to the actual humongous list of books that the scholars have authored in Arabic, then you are in so many ways oppressed and deprived. And I'm not saying this to make you feel bad. No, no, no. I'm saying this because I need to create an awareness. When you know that you have a deficiency, then you have to protect yourself, perhaps more so than others. That means you have to be more selective in regards to from who do you obtain knowledge of this deen? In an era and a time where you go on YouTube and you might type Islamic lectures because you are in the mood to learn. Allah finally guided you to listen to some beneficial knowledge so you may prosper and get closer to Allah. The reality is the options and the results are not okay. In fact, the most popular ones and the ones that will first come up are the ones you probably need to avoid the most. And you might be thinking that we exaggerate. <coughs> People involved in da'wah are always at each other's necks. There's this ongoing war and we are the victims what you don't understand is that this is a field and anybody who works in a field has an obligation to protect it if you are a doctor or an engineer and you have understood the science properly and then some individual comes into the scene with distorted information about medicine or engineering and you know that it is false and that person spreads this among the people 
rendering your positions which were in line with the original orthodox teachings to be nonsensical. It would be insane for you to be sidelined and say, oh, because we shouldn't speak about other people, so we will let this guy say whatever he wants and rant as long as he wants. If you were to do so, not soon, not too late, too much later, then the whole science will become a source of confusion for the average layman. They will no longer understand, nor can they differentiate. In fact, they will say, I'm sorry, who are you? This guy who has X amount of followers said so. And therefore, it is probably more plausible and more likable and more agreeable than yours because it has more masses behind it. Because of this situation, you will find that every now and then when someone brings to the stage some nonsense about Islam, a few individuals take it upon themselves to address this issue. Not because we're little children in the playground trying to have fun. It's because it's an obligation to protect the sanctity of this knowledge and this religion. Then Allah Azza wa Jal guides whomever He wills. Allah guides whomever He wills. But it is on the people to make that declaration. It is not an entertainment session, it is not a soap opera. It is not a Hollywood movie. It's about truth and falsehood. It's about Jannah and Jahannam. It's about you being guided or misguided. It's one of the most critical matters in the world. In fact, it is the only critical matter in the world. Nothing else matters. Everything else is insignificant when compared to this, this subject matter. <coughs> and so today, <coughs> We've had a few individuals whom have been warned against and advised perhaps in a more subtle way because the level of crime or violation wasn't that blatant. But today this can no longer be the case. After the issue of Norman Ali Khan and all the drama related to that, and we are not speaking about his personal life because his personal life is none of our business. What he did in his personal life is none of our business. We're talking about matters of the deen, the tafsir, the belittlement of aqidah, the false fabricated narrations that were conveyed to the Muslims, and the persistence of that going back until years had gone by. We have an individual <coughs> who was once considered to be a sun that was shining with the aqidah of as salaf al-salih and the righteous predecessors. Yasir Qadi, who was once an individual that you could close your eyes and take knowledge from, has continued to go off the path until we've reached a stage where the unexpected has become a fact. In his recent series on the tafsir or the elaboration on the signs of the last day, the matter of Ya'juj and Ma'juj was brought up. And what is the reality concerning Ya'juj and Ma'juj? And what I said in the beginning, <coughs> that when you don't have access to Arabic information or Arabic knowledge in the Arabic language, you're deprived, it will only be highlighted in a situation like this, where a person can technically say anything and you don't have the means of verification, you don't have the means to cross-check, so you have no option to accept or reject. <coughs> what I will do is not address the intricate aspects of the subject matter of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. I'm assuming if you read Surah Al-Kahf once in your life, of course in a language that is, a language that you understand, not in Arabic, it's beautiful to read in Arabic for the Ajib, but reading it once to know what you're reading every Friday, you would come across the ayat that have to do with Dhul Qarnayn and Ya'juj and Ma'juj and the set which he built and so on and so forth. I'm not going to make this the topic, 
Because that is not the topic. The topic is how do we address what can be considered to be controversial issues? How do we communicate them to the masses in an intelligent and wise way while maintaining our principles and foundations? While he is entitled to his view, and his view are that Yajuj and Majuj, according to a sheikh he knows, are zombies. Zombies that will come out at the end of time. Straight from Hollywood, straight from the States, into the minds of the Muslims, possibly, Allahu A'lam, zombies. Because, logically speaking, there couldn't be a group of people on earth that are blocked behind some sort of barrier and they're unable to exit, they're unable to leave until now even though according to science we've gone all over the earth and we've explored everything and so on and so forth. So from a logical point of view it doesn't make sense to him in that sense <coughs> and therefore the opinion is that they cannot possibly be people that are withheld behind a wall. No issue. Let's assume because some scholars in the past held a similar opinion. What we don't want to do is the following. First, when presenting any aspect of the deen to the average Muslim, we don't call anything problematic. If I am a sheikh and you are students of knowledge, and we are all grounded in knowledge and I present to you an issue say this is problematic meaning we have to exert more effort into investigating evidences and so on and so forth that's fine in that context that's fine but to speak to a, a, a bunch of Muslims and supposedly our fear is that they're leaving Islam this issue is making them leave Islam so in order for us not to let them leave Islam, we try to misinterpret or reinterpret the text so that it will make more sense to them, so they can feel comfortable, okay, now I can remain a Muslim. When you speak into this caliber of people and you present the issue as problematic, that is a problem. Because you've already given it a bad taste that cannot be removed no matter what you do. First and foremost, ya akhi, there is nothing problematic in the matters of faith. Either you are a mu'min, like Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, or you have issues with your iman, like the rest of us. When the Prophet wasallam said to the people of Quraysh that I was taken into Al-Maqdis, and from Al-Maqdis I was taken ascension into the heavens, they thought that he was saying nonsense. And the people came to Abu Bakr and said, have you heard what your friend said? He claimed such and such. He said, if he said it, I believe it. I trust him in regards to what he brings down from Allah. The Quran, the revelation, I'm not going to trust him about this. This is the Iman of Abu Bakr Siddiq. This is the moment. Whatever you come across in the Quran and the Sunnah, either it makes sense to you, Alhamdulillah, congratulations, or it doesn't make sense to you for whatever reason, no problem, you have no problem. You say, Sabina wa Atana. I submit. I submit. I'm not going to oppose the text. I'm not going to reject the text. I'm not going to try to find some twisted interpretation to make it agreeable. I submit, this is a moment. When we have problems with our Iman, then we start struggling with these matters. Wait, but, however, then we come up with all types of justifications to substantiate our disagreement with revelation. So the matter is clear. When we present the topic, there's nothing problematic. You say this is an interesting issue that we can elaborate on. Number one. Number two. It is only fair that when we present these issues to the masses, we begin by saying that this is an issue which the scholars have differed about. This is a matter which the scholars have a valid difference of opinion about and some scholars say such and such and they cite this evidence uh, or this opinion to support their position 
And other scholars cite this evidence to support their opinion, their opinion and their position. This is how you present an issue which requires more in-depth understanding to the masses. But to clown and make fun of medieval scholars, the Salaf al-Salih became medieval. It's a more appropriate term now to describe our righteous predecessors. That they were some weirdos who just didn't have, didn't know any better, so they accepted the information just as the, per the apparent meaning, and then now we have become so intelligent and so wise and so broad that we have a better understanding is not fair. It's not fair to them and it's not fair to the Muslims because in their minds they would forever associate that era with people that had no idea what was going on and that's not fair. You are insinuating a superiority of the later generations to the earlier generations when the Prophet ﷺ clearly <coughs> clearly gave the superiority to the earlier generations to the la 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 latter generations. They are definitely superior. Never do we say something that will belittle their status or their intelligence or their status with Allah. So maintaining a level of respect, ya akhi, when you want to speak about them, when you're addressing your crowd, keep some respect for the, for the older generations, even if you disagree with them. Thirdly, you are not Ibn Taymiyyah. Wallahi billahi tallahi, you are not Ibn Taymiyyah, not even close, ya Shaykh. Come off that pedestal and relax already. Calm down, man. Come back to earth with us human beings. When you become so self-amazed with your opinion, then the first thing that comes to mind is Iblis. قال أنا خير من خلقتني من نار وخلقته من طين. إبليس was a devout worshiper of Allah, worshiping Allah among the angels even though he was not of them. It got into his head until he opposed Allah on the grounds that he is better than Adam. He said to Allah, "You created me from fire. You created him from clay." In his feeble mind, fire was superior to clay, so self-amazed that he refused to obey Allah and he was cursed until eternity. Self-amazement is a dangerous disease. <coughs> Calm down. Relax. It does not matter how long you've learned, it does not matter how much knowledge you have. What matters is how humble you are with this information. If you look at the real scholars, you will be amazed. You will be amazed how humble they were and how much they belittled themselves. They did not see themselves as anything. Look, the Sahaba. Ya layta Muhammad lam talib Umar. Umar ibn al-Khattab, the one who for the shaitan sees him on one side of the road will go to the other. He said, I wish the mother of Umar never gave birth to Umar. The people that were giving letters of Jannah would say that if they heard that everybody entered Jannah and one person would be deprived, I would be afraid of that person who won't go to Jannah with the people. Or that if one, one leg, one foot was in Jannah, I would not be secure until the other one is in. Nowadays we read a few books, we go to a couple of universities, we pick up a couple of PhDs, and excuse me, I think, I believe, my opinion, my interpretation, la ya shaykh, too much wallah. It's an overkill, and it has a sour taste, and it doesn't work well. If we were to humble ourselves a little bit more, then we would understand at least the means of communication when you want to convey such information to the Muslims for Allah's sake. Think about them. Think about the outcome and the consequences of what you say and how it will affect the masses. 
consider these matters. But when the issue has already become a big issue, it's very easy to fix it. Just mention that the Shaykh of our Shaykh, Abdul Rahman bin Nasir al-Sa'di, held such and such opinion, and before him such and such Shaykh had such and such opinion, and y'all just making a big fuss out of nothing, and you accusing me out of nowhere, and you slandering me, and then the people say, oh, oh, subhanallah, oh, wallah, wallah, Shaykh, sorry, we oppressed you. Of course they don't have the means to go back to read what Shaykh Abdul Rahman bin Nasir al-Sa'di said, and what his opinions were, and so on and so forth. Nobody has the means except a few people to verify and cross-check, and therefore they believe that the person is now innocent when they're not. Because the opinions are not the same. At least the opinion of the Shaykh was logical in the sense that he sees that the Yajuj and Majuj are already the different nations around us. They've already been able to go out. <coughs> didn't say that there will be some zombies towards the end of time. And to pick on an opinion of a sheikh and then use it as means to confuse the current masses is also not befitting. Where is the concept of shubuhat? Stay away from the doubtful matters. And leave that which you doubtful about to that which you have no doubt about. Sure, everyone is entitled to his opinion. <coughs> but what you tell the people is what matters the most. And we're not calling for insincerity. We're calling to the concept of khatibun nasa ala qadri uquni and speak to the people according to their understanding. We have a phenomena of atheism. We have a phenomena of apostasism. People leaving Islam. They're leaving Islam because they were never grounded in Islam properly to begin with. If you think you can fix it by dealing with every controversial issue or every confusing matter by giving it a new modern interpretation, you're dead wrong. Because every time you resolve an issue, you will create another one. The whole concept of the religion is based on Iman. And in the second part of the khutbah, inshallah, we will address exactly what that is so that there will be no room for confusion. الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. Brothers, look at the articles of faith. أن تؤمن بالله. No one has seen Allah. وملائكته. His angels. No one has seen his angels. وكتبه. And the scriptures. The only one which we have, the Quran. But we believe in the gospel of Jesus. And we believe in the Sahaf of Ibrahim and Musa and the Torah of Musa. We believe we've never seen them. Well, Rasulih, you've never seen any of the messengers of Allah. You've never seen any of the messengers of Allah. Well, Yawm al-Akhir, you haven't seen the last day. Well, Qadri Khayri wa Shari, and to believe in preordainment and, and, and predestiny, and it's all from the unseen and the unknown. Our whole religion is based on believing in the unseen and leave your logic at home if it's a problem for you as we speak there are two angels on our shoulders writing down our deeds <coughs> where are they how big are they how does it work on what do they write i haven't seen it it doesn't make sense to me what about this what about that no 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 you can't go like this you cannot go like this you will go nowhere you will wind up with no Iman at all. Allah gave us enough signs for our intellect to believe in Him. Once you have believed, then you have to submit. And once you submit, Wallahi, it is the most satisfying feeling in the world. You are the king on earth. You got nothing to worry about. Anything that you come across from the Quran and the Sunnah, ala rahib wa sa'a, ahlan wa sahlan. The only thing left is I ask Allah to give me the power and the energy and the strength to implement it. Or oh Allah allow me to implement it, to live by those standards. That's it. 
I am never, as a Muslim, you, I am never, you speak about yourself, I am never had a debate with what Allah revealed. I am never facing issues with it. I'm not never trying to understand it because it doesn't make sense. But if you think you can save the youth by giving them some modern interpretations that are more agreeable to their intellect, then I promise you, five minutes later, they will give you a more complicated issue that you will not be able to explain away. And I believe Dr. Yasser, being someone who's given da'wah to not Muslims, you should know this very well. Any one of us who sat down with a non-Muslim, who doesn't want to believe, it's a roller coaster of misconceptions. And no matter how eloquent you are, and how convincing you are, and how persuasive are your arguments, you will fail. Why is a man allowed to marry for a woman? Um, well, you go into some very beautiful explanation and you mention the logic and the wisdom behind it. Why are women supposed to cover up? Why is there fighting in Islam? How come you prophet married more than four women? Why did you prophet marry Aisha at a young age? And, and, and the list goes on. And inshallah, if you say the step and tell me, I've given him all the answers, at the end of the day, he will still find a reason not to believe. Because they don't want to believe. They have a problem with Allah. They have a problem with Allah Himself. You think another matter is going to fix it? And similarly, the youth that are in danger of leaving Islam, you trying to find some modern interpretation for Yajuj and Majuj will not fix the problem. Because you have a bigger problem with the Dajjal and with the Dabbat al Ard and with all the events of Yawm al Qiyamah, the whole resurrection, the concept of resurrection. You say, Yahi, it's a piece of cake. Allah shows me in the ground. In the ground, you put a seed, some water comes down, and some sun, and I see a plant growing. Is this logical or not logical? It's the most logical thing in the world. Allah will bring us back from the dead. The kuffar of Quraysh will say, no way. We will be taken back out. They said to the Prophet who will bring this bone back when it's decayed? The one who made it the first time will be able to bring it back. They wanted to use their brain, it didn't make sense to them. They remain to be disbelievers. You know why? If you think from a logical point of view, how can it not make sense to them? It's because they don't want to believe. The issue is not with, with Qiyamah or Ba'ath or Resurrection. The issue is with Iman. They don't want Iman. That they look for excuses. They will look for excuses. If someone wants to leave Islam, you have two options. Two options. Either you say, come, come, come. What parts of Islam do you not like? I will change them for you. Mashi, I will do a nice little job for you. Everything you have a problem, I'll fix it for you to the best of my ability, but please, please, Paul, please stay a Muslim. Option number one. Guess what? It won't work. Option number two is, you give him da'wah to the true Islam. If Allah guides him, Alhamdulillah, if he wants to go astray, Allah musta'an. You're not better than the Prophet وسلم, who lost his family members to kufr and disbelief, including Abu Talib. You're not better than him. No one is better than him. وَمَا عَلَى الرَّسُولِ إِلَّا الْبَلَاغُ الْمُبِينَ The only obligation of the messenger is clear delivery of the message. That's it. This is Islam. This is Iman. If you want to go to Jannah, حَيَّكَ Allah. If you want to go elsewhere, may Allah guide you. This is to all the Muslims in the world. We're not going to run after anybody who wants to leave Islam and threaten us. I will leave Islam. Ya Shaykh, if you leave Islam, you will go to hell. It won't, it, won't, it won't kill any one of us. But out of love and mercy for a fellow human being, we want you to stick around. But I'm not going to make you stick around by changing the religion. That's not going to happen. And that is our obligation as people of da'wah. Our obligation is to convey the true message of Islam to the people. And when there are issues that are controversial or there are multiple opinions, even that we present to the people in a manner where we don't create confusion among them.
or we don't compromise the fundamental principles upon which this religion is based. And from the get-go, we should mention that there are such such opinions by such such scholars so that the people can understand, okay, you're not bringing something from your own house. But to make it seem like it's your own opinion because you're so intelligent and so wise and so Ibn Taymiyyah of your time and then when you get into trouble you say, oh, by the way, some other sheikh said this before me. It's pretty tricky and unbefitting of your stance. So I advise myself and you to be consistent. Our Iman fluctuates, all of us. We have good days and bad days. But the message of Islam should always be the same. And when one of us fails in implementing, we should be honest enough with the people and say, it's my weakness, make dua for me. If you want to say that. It's my weakness, I'm working on it. Don't try to play with the religion because of our own inability to come to terms with the revelation. This is the reality of the situation and this is what you need to be mindful of. So in, in the, the summary of all this, my brothers in faith, I beg you for Allah's sake, be very selective in regards to the people you learn Islam from. Whether it is in Urdu or Tagalog or English, they are good examples and sadly bad examples all over the place. And you might become so attached personally to an individual that they completely poison your brain and you can no longer see the light ever again. So before you create this emotional attachment with any individual, verify whether this person is upon the aqidah and the manhaj of our righteous predecessors. That is the yardstick of salvation. Allahumma ya muqallib al-qurub Thabit qurubana ala deenik Allahumma ya musarrif al-qurub Isrif qurubana ala ta'atik Rabbana la tuzir qurubana ba'da adha daytana wahab lana min ladunka rahmatan innaka anta al-wahab Allahumma ati nufusana taqwaha wa zakiha anta khayru man zakaha anta waliyuha mawlaha wa anta ala kulli shayin qadir Allahumma akfir al-muslimin wa al-muslimat wa al-mu'minin wa al-mu'minat al-ahyai minhum wa al-amwat اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا رب العالمين لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إنا كنا من الظالمين فاغفر لنا يا رب العالمين وصلي اللهم وسلم على نبينا محمد <تصفيق>